thank you folks very, very, very much. Uh, um, it's, I haven't, this is the first time I've been to the campus and it kind of brings back old memories because as was announced, I'm from uh, uh, Oklahoma State, which used to be called Oklahoma A&M. So I'm, I'm used to the concept, you know, when I was at Oklahoma State, you know, my two favorite football teams were Oklahoma State and whoever was playing Oklahoma University. So, so, uh, so I feel uh, quite at home. Uh, I'm a little bit intimidated talking to uh, you students. So uh, I used to teach regularly before I came to Texas at the Health Science Center and I've been mostly involved in research. So I want you folks, I'm going to be asking you questions. So I don't want you to just sit there and write stuff down because I guarantee you I'll give them no questions to ask. Or if it's a question, it'll be a true false. You know, can you slow down aging? So what I want to do today is to talk about two things. First, can we slow down aging? And then I want to go into should we for a few minutes. Um, if you probably all have seen various uh, uh, news reports about people living longer. I always, I don't like to go grocery shopping, but when I go shopping, I like to stop where they have the Inquirer, these m magazines, and you can figure there's going to be three stories. One, it's about some congressman or somebody having sex with somebody, or it's about aliens, <laughs> or it's about stopping aging, you know, and so I get some of my best ideas from uh, the grocery store. So this is a mom that stopped aging at 59, 51. This kind of combi combines the aliens and the aging because it's in Russia and aliens came to help brain transplant and you can live 2,500 years of age. And then there's always the diets. In other words, this diet or that diet. So the question I want us to talk about today is can we slow down aging? So because we all know that there's these claims out there, but everybody see, you don't see anybody living to be three or 400 years of age. So I want to just take a poll here. So how many people think that we can't slow down aging, that there, it will be impossible to do? We have a few. How many feel that it would be possible to do? And then how many just don't give a damn? <laughs> John, <laughs> we got, I got one. <laughs> okay, so I want to first start out with this question. Now, there are these three ladies. I want you to tell me which is the youngest looking lady. Now, we all know that these are trick questions, so it, it'll be the one that looks the oldest. But I want you just to be honest here, just look at these three to s tell me which one looks the youngest. Now, the, the, this one's out because this one does look old. So it's between these two. So how many would say the middle one looks the youngest? Raise your hands. Not very many people. This one? So everybody's going with this. It, it's usually even between these two. So if we look at the ages, we can see that there's really not much difference. But the real question that I want to do is ask a little bit different one. Let's take the middle lady who's 51 and we'll look at her about 17, 18 years later. So she's really aged a great deal. Now let's take the other lady. The picture was in her mid 40s. I don't have a picture of her 20 years later and I don't have a picture of her 40 years later and I don't have a picture of her 60 years later, but I do have a picture of her 80 years later. 80. Math. This is John Calmay, who lived to be 122 years of age. She holds the record for the person who is the longest known living person whose age has been documented. You'll see some claims for other people, but this is the one that they know that she lived to be 122 years age because they have her birth certificate, her confirmation, and her wedding uh, marriage certificate. So they really have it uh, documented on when uh, she was born and how long. In fact, Jean Calmet is the only person who has been known to live over 120 years of age. Now, there's always somebody that's the oldest person in the world, and what would you guess? I actually don't know what the oldest age person is right now, but what would you guess would be the, about the age? 114. 
<laughs> okay, 114, because it's usually somewhere between 112 or 118. It's usually in that range uh, that your oldest person will be. So actually, Jean Calmet living to be 122 was very, very rare. And the one thing that I want to emphasize to you is that it wasn't that she just lived that long, was but she, she was very healthy or younger for her age. For example, we know that she took up fencing at about 80 years of age. <laughs> the other thing that I find very interesting is we know that she was riding a bicycle when she was in her hundreds. And the reason we know that is because she fell off the bike and broke her arm and it healed and she was back on the, 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 the uh, bicycle again. My favorite story about Jean Calmet is that when she was 90 years of age, she had this apartment uh, in France, apparently, that people w wanted to b purchase from her. And a colleague or a friend said, and I think he was in his uh, late 60s or, or early 60s, and he said, you know, I'd like to have that. And she says, okay, let's make a deal. You give me $500 a month, and when I die, you get it. Now, that sounded like a good deal. But... He died at 77 years of age, and her, her uh, uh, children, or his children, paid for it until she eventually uh, died and left uh, at 122. So you want to make, be a little bit careful when you're making these deals with people. Just because they're 90 years of age doesn't mean they're going to tip off in the next five or six years. Now. Now this is an example, so what I wanted to do is show you that even within individuals that there is a great deal of difference in how we age. Jean Calmet is at that one extreme case where she aged relatively slowly. But if we look at nature or use a comparative biology approach, we can see that Age is something that's very, very flexible. And down through evolution, we can see that, that different animals have been selected to have different lifespans. You can go to an insect such as Drosophila that lives about 30, three months to a mouse that lives three to four years in captivity, not in the wild. Dogs live to be 10 to 20 years, depending on their uh, uh, background. Usually smaller dogs live longer. And birds are exceptionally long lives, mainly because they can avoid predators. And some of the birds can even live up to 100 years of age, as much as human beings. So what I want to emphasize to you is that aging is not something that's impossible to change. In other words, as I pointed out, is we can see that in individuals we age at different rates or different species have different lifespans. So, so this is something that can be changed. It's a biological process. But the big question here, well, one of the things that I wanted to point out, I, I'm sorry, is that some of you may say, well, those animals age differently than we do. And I want to use an example of this happens to be my dog, uh, which was called Trey, uh, we found him when he was about 15 years of age, the vet told us, and then we essentially nursed him for the next three years, which was damned expensive, I'll tell you this. <laughs> and Trey, what I want to emphasize here is that the conditions that Trey faced, because he would have been an older dog, were much the same as your grandparents or parents may be facing. Trey was essentially blind, he, would, he could walk along, and he'd be walking along here, and he'd walk right into that uh, 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 stool or something. He was deaf, had lost most of his teeth. He had been diagnosed with a type of cancer. It didn't kill him, but, but uh, the year before he died. It, but he ultimately died because of heart and renal failure, which is not unusual in the human population. So he exhibited many of the same characteristics that individual human beings and most animal models so so that all animal models sh show an aging process that's very similar to what we see and yet Trey died when he was 18 years of age he could hardly walk he could as I said he was blind and couldn't hear yet at 18 years of age if you can imagine that I was very healthy and robust at the same age so 
the dog was aging at a different rate than I was. And what we really want to know, understand in aging, is what is it that causes this difference in aging? Now, the one thing that I really want to talk about today is, okay, I've shown you that different individuals will age differently, probably a, to a large extent to their genetics. Different species will age differently. But can we take, let's say, a mouse, and can we slow its aging down? And we, the answer to that is yes. And much of that research was done at San Antonio, but not all of it. And this is a process that we know as caloric restriction. And I want to just stay on this slide for just a few minutes because what we do here, this could either, this happens to be for mice, but it could be rats or mice. And this is just a survival curve. And this shows the percent of animals that are alive. We start with 100% of the animals. And then as they age, uh, these would be maintained in the laboratory under very uh, uh, controlled, uh, careful conditions, you can see that these animals would eventually die. And so in the black is the survival curve for mice that are fed what we call ad libitum, allowed to eat as much food as they want. They don't become, this strain of mice doesn't become uh, um, obese, but this is considered to be the optimum nutrition. And the other group here in the blue line were fed 40% less, and they adjust their body sizes about 40% less. But the key here is look at the longevity. We see that in the ad libitum animals, almost all of them, well, all of them are dead by about 38 months of age. On the other hand, if we look at our caloric restricted animals, we can see that almost 50% of them are still alive and they live out to almost 50 months of age. There's been about a 25 to 30% increase in lifespan. If this happened in human beings, we would be talking about people having an average life expectancy of, well, let me ask you that. What's the average life expectancy in the United States now? Do I have a, I have a 75? Anybody want to go a little higher? It's 78 for the uh, women are usually a little, so for uh, males that are born now it's about 78. For women that are born or female babies it's about 80 years of age. So if you increased it, the average life expectancy would be you'd be talking about would be 100 to 120 years of age. Okay, now. The one thing I want to emphasize here is not only, remember John Calme, not only do these mice live longer, but they look younger. We not only increase the lifespan, but we have improved the health span. And I'll let you folks judge for yourself. Now, probably not all of you are aware of, uh, what, what, how would you describe an old mouse? Slow. Slow. <laughs> Okay, that's, a, that's not a bad answer. So now this is not going to be an old mouse. This is going to be a mouse about your age. This is what I would call a college age mouse when they're at their peak reproductivity and activity. And you can see these mice are very active. One of the things, they have this rearing behavior. And they're also, you know, they have this kind of sleek, glossy coat looking cloaks. Okay, those look pretty good, right? Now we're going to look at... The next one is a 28-month-old mouse, which would be roughly like a 75-year-old, 80-year-old person. So we'll see if you're right on the slow. Come on, go. They are slow, right? I haven't slowed this down. This is the same speed. So you can see that they're much less active. One of the things you don't see is this rearing behavior. And if you look at it, they, they don't get white or bald, but they have this this coat, and they're always looking through the, uh, for their glasses. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is an old. Now the next slide film I'm, clip I'm going to show you are these are going to be mice that are the same age but were calorically restricted mice. So you can see that they're much more active. They exhibit this rearing behavior that you didn't see in the other animals. And if you look at their coats, they look better. 
Uh, any of you would have come in and if you would have seen these mice and didn't know their age, you'd say, oh, these are much younger than the other animals. So the one thing I want to emphasize is not only have we increased lifespan, but if you look at these animals, and we've looked at a lot of physiological processes, they appear to be better and younger. They would, so that when you slow down aging, not only do the animals live longer, but they're going to be, appear younger. And with that, we're going to see that caloric restriction decreases most age-related diseases in mice that, when this is given. Cancer, atherosclerosis, autoimmune disease, sarcopenia, which is muscle loss, Alzheimer disease, and ALS, and a variety of things. So the Im important thing to get from this is you don't just increase lifespan, but you have an impact on health span and on age-related diseases, probably most diseases. Now, Okay, so we talk about caloric restriction, and in the past 10 years, there's been a variety of genetic manipulations that have shown that we can, in mice, make them live longer, and they appear to be more youthful. Now, the one question that I've always got from reporters is, when will there be a pill to slow down aging? And I always tell my students is, you know, the first time they asked me, I didn't know what to say, because you know you don't want to say, well, it's going to be a long time ago away because you're going to have some congressman say, oh, we don't need research anymore. So you want to keep it very interesting. And so I usually say, oh, around five to ten years, because five to ten years doesn't sound too bad. And nobody will remember in five to ten years what you said. And to be frank, I honestly, if I would have told the people correctly at that time, and I believe this up to about two to three years ago, I'd say, well, it's going to happen because aging is a process that we can solve. It's a very complicated process, but probably I won't see it in my lifespan. Now, I've, my whole philosophy has changed largely to some research that's happened right here in Texas and San Antonio. And this is a compound called rapamycin. Now, this is where I was going to have the video, and I don't think I'll, I'll try the video. But let me tell you a little bit of the ha history of rapamycin. This is an uh, antibiotic uh, was a, a, found as an antifungal agent on Easter Island. They determined its structure, and I know none of you are chemistry, and it's only show this for uh, the chemist, and that's, I'm a chemist, so I do that for my own. In 93, Wythe Pharmaceuticals had a patent for this. It's FDA approved in humans, and it's currently being used. Primarily, it started being used as an uh, 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 immune suppressor in combination with cyclosporin and other immunosuppressants in tissue transplants, kidney and uh, heart transplants, to reduce the immune system so that individuals would not reject the uh, heart or kidney. It's now currently being used as a potential anti-carcinogen. Now, one of the things that happened that was very important in this area in 1990s was they determined exactly what rapamycin was doing. Remember, this was discovered because if they would put this on funguses, they would quit growing. And so what they found was the key to this was a protein which is called target of rapamycin. Not a very sexy name, but it's, it's the protein that rapamycin works on. And what rapamycin does in not only fungi cells, but in all eukaryote cells, including mammal cells, is it binds to a small protein that we all make, FKB, and these two essentially bind to this target of rapamycin and does its business. This is how rapamycin stops fungi from growing. Initially, they thought this would be a great antifungal agent, and they found that it wouldn't because it not only affects the fungus cells, but it affects our own cells, mammalian cells. Now, in the last 10 years, there's been enormous growth in this area, and now we know of this mTOR signaling, this is mammalian TOR signaling, and I'll just give you folks just a few minutes to write down this pathway, which you'll be <laughs> cross. Now, I only show that in there because, uh, just to show how complex, but this has become 
10, 15 years ago, we knew nothing about this pathway. Now this has become one of the hottest pathways around. And what is it all about? And this is, this is how I like to present the mTOR pathway. It's key because this is how, this is a critical pathway in telling cells what the environment's all about. In other words, cells have to have some way of saying, are there nutrients around and should I grow? Or if there are nutrients around and I shouldn't grow? And it's this pathway, the TOR, uh, that actually recognizes it. So if you have a lot of nutrients around, and let's just think that we have a little fungi cell here, or you have growth factors if you're a more complex organism like us, they interact with the TOR pathway and that tells the cell, it drives a whole bunch of process and it causes the cell to grow and to divide and proliferate. The other thing that happens, and I want to mention this, is a little bit complicated, but it also blocks, and this is what we do uh, in uh, molecular biology. Whenever we have something like this, it says it's blocking, this means it's stimulating. So when you turn on the mTOR pathway, it blocks a process that we call autophagy. And this is a process that degrades proteins and protein complexes. So what happens is, how this came about was that the bacteria use this way as to fool the fungus, it, fungus into thinking that it was starving. And so the bacteria would produce rapamycin. The fungi would see the rapamycin and say, oh, there's, there's, it would, oh, oh let me show I need to show you. So what happens with rapamycin is that it blocks mTOR. And so even though you have nutrients or growth factors, the cell, because this is blocked, thinks that it's starving. And so it stops growth and proliferation. And the other thing it does, it turns up the autophagy because it needs to get a source of amino acids and stuff to keep the cells surviving. So what the bacteria has done is tricked the fungus into thinking that there's no growth around and so it sits there and doesn't grow and the bacteria says, oh good, there's a lot of these nutrients, we can use them to grow ourselves. So the key with respect to aging, you might say, well, how does that have anything to do with aging? Well, Dave Sharp at our institution oh, about 10 years ago said, well, you know, if this TOR signaling pathway is important, in, in other words, if this is a way to sense nutrients, we know that in caloric restriction we decrease nutrients, so he proposed that this mTOR pathway was how caloric restriction caused the animals to live longer. And the key here was, which, and this is what was beautiful, is you could actually test it. Because if you fed mice rapamycin, and he was right, this should act like caloric restriction. Except the animals would eat all they would want, but you have turned off the TOR pathway, and you would turn off growth proliferation and others, and you would have a animal that would live longer. Now this was a real neat idea, and I remember when he told me, I said, well that sounds really great, but it's too good to be true. <laughs> and this is one of the things, particularly for those folks that are going into research, that you, that's really kind of interesting, is he couldn't get anybody to bite on this, even though it sounded like it was a little bit too far out there. And it was, took about four about five to six years before he was able to essentially do the experiment to test this. And this was done with, uh, in collaboration with Randy Strong, and this was part of a intervention testing center at San Antonio. And what they would do is at three sites, they would feed animals rapamycin or other compounds and see if they lived longer. And so we were able to do that and Randy, as I said, is, is the head of the, the program at uh, the Health Science Center. A little bit, uh, almost two years ago, we came out with a publication showing that rapamycin increased lifespan. It was published in one of the premier journals. And this shows the increase in lifespan that we see. In other words, these are males and these are females. The increase in lifespan was about 10 to 15%. 
This would be equivalent in human populations to if we cured cancer and heart disease both. So that even though it sounds like it's a small increase in lifespan, if we're looking at its comparability to uh, uh, cancer and age, uh, heart disease, the major killers in our society, this would be equivalent. Now, I want to emphasize why this imp study was so important. It was the first time that anyone had shown that you could extend lifespan in a mammal, a mouse, by a pharmaceutical agent. People had always talked about it, and you've seen something. This is the first scientific demonstration that this could happen. Most of us in aging were not expecting it. Why? Because we said, I would have said, oh, well, this is, aging is so complex, you can't have just one thing work. Probably the reason that it works is because this TOR signaling pathway is so complex. The other thing that was probably the most important and blew the mind of most of the people in aging was this happened when it was started late in life of the mice. The caloric restriction, I don't know if I made the point, but caloric restriction we started early in life, usually about when the mice would be high school age, and we continue it. And it's generally thought that aging starts pretty well when you reach sexual mat maturity, and if you wait too long, you're not going to have an effect on lifespan. This study was started when the mice would have been roughly like a 60 to 65 year old person. And so when they did it, they, they didn't set it up to be that way, but they got the animals ready to give the diet and they found out that the, the diet wasn't, that, that when they mixed it in the food, that it wouldn't uh, essentially, uh, it would, was degrading in the food. And so they had to come up with a way to prevent it from degrading, and they did that by encapsulating. By the time they figured out what they needed to do, these mice were now 20 months of age. They were like 60 years. And they were sitting there saying, well, should we do feed them or not? Because if they didn't feed them, they would have terminated the mice. And everybody thought, well, it's not going to work, but we've got the mice. We just as well do it. So it's one of those, this is totally serendipity. We would have never set this up to do it that late in life. But this is important because this tells us that we could have an effect on aging and we don't have to have a person taking the anti-aging thing for all of their life. It could be later in life. Yes, please do. Please do. Right. I'll talk. I'll talk about that. Yeah, because of the, what's published out there is the lifespan. But that's the other critical point. Right. Generally, the what we in aging view that if we can increase the lifespan, and I didn't emphasize, but the maximum, in other words, not just the mean, but that, that part when they ultimately die, if we can do that, we probably have had an effect on aging, and if we had an effect on aging, it would affect health span. But that's a good question, that, and, and we'll look at it in a minute. The other thing was this was replicated at three sites and it's been turned around and they've replicated it again. In fact, when they did it the second time, they started feeding the animals the rapamycin earlier in life. And you'd expect you'd get a bigger bang for your buck. They didn't get much difference, which is really, for an aging person, is really exciting because it tells us that we don't have to essentially start uh, to slow down aging in, in individuals, we don't have to start it real early in life. We can wait until the latter part of life. Now, this was such a big breakthrough that Science Magazine named this as one of the top breakthroughs in 2009. And this is about a little bit like if your team gets to go to the NCAA finals in basketball. <laughs> It's not quite like winning it because we did, weren't rank, ranked as the first, but, but, but uh, this was a big deal. And to be frank, you know, they haven't done this a long time. I don't know of any other discovery in Texas that's made this, this list. We were not t expecting this to happen at all. We thought this was very exciting to the aging community, but we didn't realize that it would be picked up. Now, this is a question that was asked. Will rapamycin improve health span. We know that the animals are living longer and 
Will it improve health span? So, the fr so one of the things that I had mentioned to you, well, let me just back up for a minute. From a commercial standpoint, we know that getting something out there on the market to slow down aging is going to be very difficult because, first of all, FDA has no regulations or requirements on what an anti-aging medicine would be. What we went into this is that if we could find something that slowed down aging, it could be used to treat age-related diseases, such as cancer, heart disease, and a variety. Because remember I said the caloric restricted animals, when we looked at those animals and we looked at them on models that would have Alzheimer's or cancer or something, it slowed down or reduced. So the question we had was would rapamycin improve or retard or re, uh, reduce the incidence of age-related diseases? And we've looked at a variety, but the only one I'm going to talk about today is Alzheimer's disease. And for this, we had two investigators at San Antonio, each doing this and separately. And what they use is, is at most animal, in fact, I could say all animal models do not show Alzheimer's. There may be some primate models that might. But certainly mice don't get Alzheimer's. And so the way that the research community studies Alzheimer's in mouse models is they make a genetic mouse that expresses this beta amyloid, which is a mutant that we know causes Alzheimer's in people. And so when you take these mice, you're going to find that these mice develop these plaques and tangles in the brain, and the mice then have reduced cognition. Their memory is not as good. And unfortunately, we weren't able to show the videotape to show the, uh, the, 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 the system for how they measured uh, memory. But what you would see is if you looked at memory and you had a score of it, you would see that these are your transgenic mice. That get all, these are the animals that are control animals. They're, they don't have the transgene. These are the animals that have the transgene and get Alzheimer's. And you can see on this memory test, they perform about one-fourth as well. Now, the question that we had is if we give these mice rapamycin, what will happen to their memory? And we were really kind of concerned because there were studies out there that suggested that in your brain that you, and memory that you needed to have protein synthesis. And it's suggested that rapamycin or TOR might affect this process. So when we did this, we would have not been surprised. We'd have been disappointed, but not surprised if the animals didn't uh, perform as well. But what was interesting is you can see is these transgenic animals perform just as well on this test. In other words, they don't show the deficit in cognition. If you look at the plaques, these are the amyloid plaques that you would see. You can see the animals that had received rapamycin, this dark staining material, which is a blow up of this. There's less of this plaque material and less, in this case, these would be phosphorylated tangles. There'd be less of this material. So we have, we've shown that rapamycin in a mouse model would have an effect on Alzheimer's. We're really very excited about this because as probably most of you know is that there is no treatment for Alzheimer's right now. So, and I should point out is we've looked at, I don't have time or the slides, but We've also shown that it would affect many types of cancers that these mice get, and it affects atherosclerosis in the mouse models as well. So it does have an effect on a variety of pathologies. Now, what about is physiological function? And here I'll show you a video clip. These are two mice that are 34 months of age. This would be like mice that are uh, uh, 95 to 100 years of age. And we've got our control mice mouse here, and this is the same aged mice that's fed rapamycin. And you can see again, if you look at the coat color or the activity, that the rapamycin fed animals look much, much younger. Okay, so can we slow down aging? The answer is yes. We've shown that that different species age differently. Uh, 
We've shown that caloric restriction can do this. I didn't talk about genetic manipulations that can slow down aging. The other thing that we know, is, as we've shown here, is that perhaps rapamycin, certainly in mouse models, appears to slow down aging. So the question now that I want us to, and I want to have a little discussion here, is should we? In other words, what if there was an anti-aging pill? Would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing or bad thing? Quality of life. Oh, yeah. yeah, some people you really wouldn't want them to live longer. So, 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 so generally I have about 70% of the people who say yes, and there are usually a few people that says no, that this is not a good thing. So why, why would slowing down aging be a bad thing? Go back to health. Yeah, the health. The usual, the one thing that people will often say is, what? We've got enough old people around. Now, you want to be careful when you say that, that you're not in a nursing home or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, so, so the comment is, Lord, look at the problems that we've got. We're talking about Social Security. We're talking about Medicare. And if we've got more and more people living in nursing homes, this is going to be a disaster. So don't do anything about the aging process. That makes sense, kind of, right? A little bit. Now, what I want you to do, if you don't get anything else out of this class, is this the next five minutes is very important because that's baloney. Let's, let's look at what happens if we cure cardiovascular disease and cancer. I mean, the state of Texas is pouring a lot of money into curing cancer. So what happens if we cure these? Okay, we know one thing is that we'll increase the longevity. It's been predicted that if you cure both of these, the lifespan will increase about 10 years. Now, the other question that I have here is, okay, how much money are we going to save if we were able to do this? How many would say 10%? We'll save 10%. Anybody for 10%? 20%. What? What? Maybe 20%. What more? 40%? Zero. Zero percent. Zero. Twenty. 200%. We're going to say, go, okay, we got, high. okay, here's what, the, here's what the epidemiologists tell us. It's not going to save us any money. It's going to cost us 15% more. It's not going to save us money. Why? No, no, no. Actually, because remember, I, I have this little thing here. Assume the cost of the cure is zero. You're partially right with Medicare, but theoretically, you know, these people aren't, they're not in the hospital because of cancer anymore. They're not in the hospital because of, of, uh, of uh, uh, heart attacks or something. But remember, we've just cured cancer or heart disease. What have we not done anything about? The aging process. These people are aging. The one thing you want to remember about cancer and heart disease, these are diseases of the elderly. Most cancers are very rare before 40 to 50 years of age, they increase, same as heart disease. So what this means is that if you take a person like me, let's say, well, somebody a little bit older than I am, that's, that's in their mid-70s, and they die of a heart attack or cancer, and you prevent that, and they live, but they're aging, we get back to the quality of life. You haven't done a great deal for their quality of life, particularly when there's another disease lurking out there, such as Alzheimer's, or it could be Parkinson's, or even if you pre prevented all the disease and you had this. Remember Trey? He couldn't see or couldn't hear. This is, and you'll have muscle mass loss. This is something that John is studying. This is really very, very important in quality of life. And Alzheimer's is particularly particularly devastating, uh, as probably many of you know. My mother happens to ha have uh, be suffering it from it she just uh, in the past year. But the one thing I want to emphasize that's particularly important to those of us that are in the older segment of this pop group is that look at this, that up when you get 
populations above 95, you're talking about 40% of the population has Alzheimer's. So the reason that curing heart disease and cancer are going to cost more is because the aging process is occurring and many of the very costly diseases like cancer or these sorts of things are going to have to be taken care of. And this is where I would make the argument that slowing down aging would be important. In other words, if we're going to have a major effect on quality of life in our population, we're going to have to do something about the aging process because that's what's going to be affecting the quality of life. You folks are younger, so you, you, the people I would tell you to look at would be your grandparents. So what would happen if rapamycin worked? And this will be an example that I've got. This is supposed to be uh, 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 true. So this is a, supposedly a 92-year-old woman dancing with her 29-year-old grandson. <laughs> That flip, I can understand because I cannot flip very, very fast. But uh, the, 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 the underlying thing that I want to point out is there's no doubt, I mean, I would say even if this person was 72 years of age, it would be very impressive. But what I want to point out here is when we're talking about slowing down aging, this person at 92 is an outlier, an extreme outlier. If we were able to do something about the aging process, this is what could be the common uh, or would be normal. So thank you very much. And if you've got any questions, I'd be very, very happy to answer them.